This is the Zoom Live Track Elite. It's a digital podcast mixer which was released late 2019 and it has no Bluetooth, no built in USB Mix Minus, no accompanying software. It's not plug and play either, so you still need to install drivers so that it works as an audio interface and it only has 54 decibels of gain. So, why the heck am I still talking about it in 2023? Well, because there are a number of things that it does better than pretty much any other podcasting device out there, almost four years after its release, while being cheaper than all of the usual suspects, even cheaper than its in-house competitor, the Zoom PodTrack P8, at a price of below $400. So let's turn the tables. Why would you consider it over the Rodecaster Pro, the Rodecaster Pro 2, the Tascam Mixcast 4, or the Zoom PodTrack P8, for that matter, despite all the shortcomings I've started with? Well, first of all, if you need six microphone inputs, it's just the LiveTrack L8 and the PodTrack P8 remaining in the race. The Rodecaster Pros and the Mixcast 4 only have four mic inputs. But if you also want a remote guest to dial in on top of the six being present, then it's only the LiveTrack L8 that can do it for you. And this is the most obvious capability where it outclasses every other podcast recorder, but there's much more to it than what first meets the eye. Let's start with the ability to record a multi-track. This is quite important for post-production, as then you can apply changes to each channel easier, like voice processing. You cannot process a voice recorded through a phone call the same way as you would one that was recorded directly through a microphone. And unless you have recorded them in multi-tracks or onto separate audio tracks, you will have a hard time polishing the audio evenly. Every dedicated podcast recorder has multi-track recording built in, and they can all record separate audio tracks onto an SD card, and so does the LiveTrack L8. But while its main in-house competitor, the PodTrack P8, does not have multi-track USB recording, so it cannot send out separate USB channels into your DAW or digital audio workstation, the LiveTrack L8 has that, so it can record simultaneously into, say, GarageBand in multi-track while capturing multi-track files also to the SD card. Second, when you are about to record remote guests, you will need the so-called mix minus setup, which ensures that the audio that is coming from your remote guest does not get sent right back to them, thus it avoids creating an echo of their own voice in their ears. Dedicated podcast recorders offer this built-in, however, all do it to a variable degree. The Rodecaster Pro and the Tascam Miscast 4 offer three simultaneous options for recording a remote guest with built-in mix minus, one over USB, one over Bluetooth, and one hardwired with a TRRS port. The Rodecaster Pro 2 has three USB options and Bluetooth, so altogether four, and the PodTrack P8 does not have Bluetooth built in, so it only offers the USB mix minus and the hardwired options with a TRRS cable. However, it does so at the cost of losing two of the six mic input channels, and even if you get a Bluetooth dongle for it, it does plug in right into the TRRS port, so it's either Bluetooth or hardwired. The LiveTrack L8 has the single hardwired option, but you don't have to sacrifice any of the mic inputs for it. So if you want to line them up along how many participants you can record, it looks like this. With the Rodecaster Pro 2, you can record up to 8 people, 4 of them being present and 4 remote guests. With the original Rodecaster Pro and with the Tascam Mixcast 4, it's 7 persons, four of them being present and three remote guests. With the PodTrack P8, it's six, out of which maximum two can be remote guests. And with the Zoom Live Track L8, surprise, seven. Six being present, plus one remote guest. That is, at least, if we only count the building options. But rest assured, this little guy has a lot more up its sleeve than what we could tell based on the raw specs. Before we get on to his flexibility, if you like what you see so far, please make sure to hit the like and consider subscribing to this channel. It's full of videos about podcasting gear and tutorials like the one you're watching. At its core, the Zoom L8 is a classic mixer, only it's digital. If you've seen one mixer, you've seen them all, as they say, oh, but well, that might just not be quite the entire truth. As all mixers, it might look intimidating at first, but it's actually pretty simple to understand, as the basic operation of every mixer is that you have inputs, from where the audio goes through a channel strip, it ends up in the outputs. Everything else is specific to the mixer. Here, for example, you have a control section to operate different features of the mixer and an effects engine marked in blue. 
this is a digital mixer, but if it would be an analog one, you would see these five effect knobs lined up on the channel strip individually. Being a digital mixer, the L8 can afford not to do that. Instead, you just select which channel you want to apply an effect for, and you can then tweak it to your liking. And if you want to set up effects for another channel, just select it, and then you can make changes as you want. And the Zoom L8 will remember what you have set for which channel. Moreover, it can also recall what Zoom calls scenes, of which you can have seven. So you can set up seven different scenes for seven different shows, and you can just recall them. There's a few more noteworthy additions that make the Zoom Live Track L8 unique. First, it has faders. Faders are not very common with mixers of this size or at this price. Usually you would get knobs, so it's a very nice addition, such as the volume indicator lights beside each channel. Those are really cool. And they put on a show every time you switch them on, which is absolutely useless, but I still love it. Then it has six mic slash line level combo inputs, which is a lot. Again, more than what you would normally see in this class. Then there are two line inputs on channel seven and eight, but these are actually multi-purpose inputs. For instance, input seven can be a line input, or a USB loopback, or it can host the three sound pads below it. Well, pad is a little overstated, but they are buttons where you can load pre-recorded stuff and launch them from there. Input eight is where you also have the TRRS phone connection. You can select to use that as a source or the second USB loopback or the sound pads below it, or use it as a line input. You most likely would use it as a phone input. And this is where you get the built-in mix minus. So whatever comes in from the phone, you can record it. And whatever comes in the mixer will be sent back to the phone minus the phone itself. That's the mix minus. And finally, the outputs. It has the usual main monitor outputs. This time they are XLR outputs. But what's truly unique here is that you have not one, but four headphone outputs. One of them, of course, carries the main mix, but the other three can output individual submixes that are different to the main mix. And this is absolutely mind blowing that you can create three submixes on top of the main mix. You will see in a minute how easy it is to do so. These submixes options mean that the Lifetrack L8 has unrivaled flexibility. All three will be analog mixes and you can access them by flipping the switch for mix A, mix B and mix C respectively below the headphone ports. While this function was originally meant for musicians, it can be beautifully used for podcasting, namely to create further mix minus situations and thereby recording more remote guests. The idea is to take a phone and send its output into the mixer, then take whatever went into the mixer and send it back to the phone, only we will take out the phone's input itself from what's being sent back, so that it doesn't echo back into the phone. The way you would do it is with the help of this little adapter called the iRig 2 from IK Multimedia. It was also not meant to be used for this, by the way. It is in fact a mobile guitar interface, but it works and it's cheap. So here we go. It's a that simple four-step process. First, you'd attach the iRig to the phone, likely with the dongle, especially for newer iPhones. All right, so now the iRig is connected to the phone. Then you would want to route the phone sound through the iRig into the mixer. And the way you would do it is to take the switch on the side of the iRig 2, which says through FX, and switch it instead of through into the FX setting. What it does is it makes sure that whatever comes into the iRig 2, it also goes out from this output here, which is called the amplifier output. And the amplifier output is a mono output. I'll take a simple patch cable, plug it into the amplifier output on the iRig 2, and route it to channel 6 on the mixer. Now what we should try is to see that the phone sound is actually going into the mixer on channel 6, which is here. Let's just quickly launch uh, YouTube video. And there you go. You can see the meters moving, the iPhone sound is going into the mixer. <laughs> All right, so far so good. But now we need to make sure that the sound from the mixer is also going back into the iPhone. For that, we would use one of the headphone outputs out of the four. Well, the first one you would reserve for the main mix and for yourself to monitor everything. But then let's select mix A. Now, what you need to know here is that the headphone outputs are stereo. So what I would use here is a TRS to dual TS cable, which breaks the stereo channel 
into two mono channels. So I would just plug it in here. And now we have two mono channels carrying the same signal coming out from the headphone output. Now I would need to plug it into this single port here, which is marked with the guitar on the iRig 2. Uh, in order to do that, I would use another simple adapter, which is this one, which does exactly what I need, meaning I plug in two TS ports and it converts them down to a single mono input. And that is what I'm plugging into the iRig 2. So now we are pretty much done. What we did is that we took the phone, connected to the iRig 2, flipped the switch on the iRig 2 to effects, which made sure that the output of the iRig is coming out here on the amplifier output in mono, took a patch cable, routed it back into the mixer on channel 6, and in order to get the sound from the mixer into the iPhone, what we did is we took one of the headphone outputs using a TRS to dual TS cable, routed it back to the iRig 2, and from the iRig 2 it goes back into the phone. So now we have our phone signal going into the mixer, and from there the mixer sound is going back to the phone through mix A. Now what we need is to decide what should go out in mix A, so through this headphone port, and what we want here is to create the mix minus as the fourth and final step. In other words, let's send back the entire mix into the phone, minus the phone's sound itself, to avoid an endless feedback loop where the phone sends sound into the mixer which it sends it back into the phone and it goes back into the mixer and then back into the phone and so on and so forth. And to eliminate this and to create the mix minus you'd use the control section here. First of all you would need to flip the switch to mix A for the headphone port so that it doesn't take the master output but rather mix A. Then click on mixer, mix A and all you need to do is find the channel where the phone's input is coming in, which is channel 6 here, and then pull it down fully. That means that the entire mix is going to be sent back to the phone, but channel 6 will be at zero level. So basically you won't hear the phone sounds going back into the phone. And while still in the mixer mode, click back on master, pull back the fader so you can hear it. And actually it's indicated here where it was in the master mix. Now we are controlling the master again, and that's it. You are hearing every channel, and the phone receives the mix minus, so every channel minus itself, and voila, you can now record your second remote guest. And best of all, since you have three custom mixes, mix A, mix B, and mix C, you can set this up three times. Plus you have the built-in phone mix minus over the TRRS port. So if you count with me, if you have four phones and three iRIC 2 adapters, all in all, you can record four remote guests and you still have three mic inputs left for present podcast participants. And this is also unrivaled in this price cast, and even above it, as it is only the Rodecaster Pro 2 that can do the same. And of course, the Rodecaster Pro 2 takes it to a whole different level, but that's a $700 device, and this is below $400. And I know I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to the amount of remote guests you can record with a device, but I still believe that this is one of the biggest challenges in podcast recording, and if you've ever tried to record a corporate podcast where participants of a panel discussion are dialing in from all corners of the globe, then you start to appreciate devices that can assist you in recording them in good quality. And last but not least, where it beats every single competitor mentioned, even the Rodecaster Pro 2, is recording quality, or more precisely, recording details. The Zoom Podtrack P8 famously limits you on 44 kHz 16-bit recording, so does the Podtrack P4, and all other recorders can do 48 kHz and 24-bit, which arguably is safer for those using the audio for video as well. But the Zoom LiveTrack L8 can record up to 96 kHz, which none of its competitors can do. And granted, you cannot use it as an audio interface then, but it still records 96 kHz onto the SD card. Plus, with its matte gray finish, and with the blue and the red faders and lights everywhere, it just looks very professional. It just looks badass. So while other dedicated podcast recorders are more convenient to use, this little LiveTrack L8 has much more to it than what first meets the eye. And I hope I could successfully demonstrate it to you. With that, thanks for watching and bye for now.